Hey everybody, Danielle Hargan Raider here and welcome to another episode of Unleash Your Inner Diabetes Dominator. Today, I'm very excited to bring you an international person with diabetes that I was very lucky to have had the chance to have brunch with her and her husband when I was just in London. Her name is Liz Warren. She is half Danish, but she was born in England and grew up just south of Manchester. She was diagnosed with type one when she was 13 and has just received her 50 year medal from Diabetes UK. And I think think we're actually going to get a chance to see that medal some point later. So I'm going to finish the bio, then we're going to get to the good stuff. So Liz spent her childhood playing the piano, riding horses, and before the end, before studying at the Royal Academy of Music in London, then spent her working life first as a children's social worker, then as a civil servant working on employment, health, and education policies in Whitehall. Liz has been married to John for 33 years and has a 27-year-old son. Liz was a volunteer on her general practitioner's surgeries patient group and wrote the practice newsletters for six years. She's a patient member of the London Diabetes Strategic Clinical Leadership Group run by the NHS and has taken part in committees look, looking at pump use, the education of general practitioners and nurses, diabetic eye screenings, and she's the co-chair of the NHS's Diabetes Patient Experience Group for London. She also, also volunteers for Diabetes UK, has spoken for JDRF in the UK Parliament, takes up many diabetes research opportunities, and has helped to set up a group for type ones in Harrow where she lives. Her hobbies include singing, rambling, photography, jazz, and dancing to salsa. Wow, that is an impressive bio. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Great. So How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm very happy to have you here and uh, telling us about your 50 year kind of journey with diabetes. So as we always do with this show, let's start off with hearing about your story of diagnosis and anything you'd like to share with us about kind of the road you've traveled to get from where you were then to where you are now. Okay, well, some of it's quite hard to remember because it was a long time ago. Um, but you know, I do remember the usual thing, dying of thirst, drinking, day and night, going to the loo all the time. Um, I actually had a, my, one of my Danish aunties staying with us at the time as a nurse, and she quite quickly spotted something was wrong, so I didn't get very poorly. I went to the doctor and was immediately diagnosed as type one, and the next day I was in hospital. Um, and in those days, I spent, I can't remember if it's two or three weeks, in a children's ward, um, and actually learn the things that have been the basis of my my control and maintenance since then because they, they taught me how to carb count um, and for quite a long time in the UK they didn't teach type ones to carb count they mm. just said eat a healthy diet so <laughs> there are lots of people um, younger than me who who still to this day don't know about carb counting so I'm very grateful that I, I had that information given to me in hospital um, and things that I remember, there are several things that stand out, is the injecting in oranges. Yeah, I think everybody did that. I think that's for the test of time. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And borders of country. <laughs> yeah. The, the other thing that really, well, there's a couple of things that really stand out. I, I had a pony and I was very keen on that pony. And whilst I was in hospital, my father actually drove the horse box into the hospital's grounds oh and I was waving to my pony through the window of the hospital. I didn't go out and see her, but you know, I, I've never forgotten that. It was, it was, I don't know. Was, I would imagine that was a, an, a spectacular experience for everybody that had a window seat at the hospital that day, to be honest. When, when I look back at it, it's, it's really strange, but it's, you know, it's stuck in my mind. I just remember it very clearly. And, and actually, in retrospect, it's a really sweet thing to do for me because, you know, it was tough being oh. on my own in hospital for the first time for quite a long time. Wow. And so the, the other thing that stands out was um, we have something in the UK called Bonfire Night. Once a year on the 5th of November, um, we go and we celebrate or remember that by everybody having a bonfire outside and they have fireworks and we eat special food. And we were celebrating this in, in the hospital um, garden. And on bonfire night, you always have these sweet things. There's something called parkin and treacle toffee and stuff like that full of sugar. And I will never to this day forget 
one of the nurses when I said could, could I have some saying to me oh you'll never be able to eat that again oh, and that okay. was just like really really the only kind of bad thing that was planted in my mind from the beginning and obviously in those early years I didn't eat that sort of thing but you know I soon learned that if you inject more insulin you can you can eat what you like and I just found that out myself without any education because yeah. we didn't have education. But I can um, see that being an experience that would certainly leave a mark on you especially as a young child and then somebody absolutely. a medical professional says something like that to you. It could be, it could be definitely scary. Yeah, well, it wasn't scary, but it, you know, when, when I look back and when I tell you a bit more about my, my kind of diabetes history, um, I've had issues with food for most of my life until relatively recently. Um, and that, that nurse talking to me, you know, that it was like a trigger that really did leave its mark on me. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I left hospital and, and, and I'd just like to say something about how I was treated because I, I spend a great deal of time chatting on, on Twitter and on Facebook to people and I see a lot of very, really disturbed th things that people write about, the bad things they were told when they were diagnosed. And I can honestly say, other than the words of that nurse, nobody ever said to me that I wouldn't have a full, long life. Nobody ever said I couldn't do anything. And I am so, so grateful for that when I read what a lot of parents write now and, you know, oh, my poor kid won't be able to do this and can they do that? And, oh God, they're going swimming, what shall I do? Nobody ever said anything like that to me. And I did everything and I was never held back. I never thought or expected I wouldn't have a long and, and healthy life. I mean, you know, I knew about complications and I thought, well, yeah, that might happen. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't, I wasn't scared of, of, of being diabetic. Yeah, and I think that's a great uh, mindset to be able to kind of grow up in because I was think a lot of people, even including myself, you know, were told. And the thing is, it might have just been the same thing, lack of knowledge back then, lack, you know, lack of common sense nowadays it's like even if there are complications to be had like you're aware of them we're all aware of them but it's actually the way that somebody expresses the existence of them to us you know if somebody says you know if your blood sugars are uncontrolled all the time these complications could arise but most likely unless you're having constant terrible bad blood sugar readings you know for your whole life and then again they may never exist or someone saying to you you're most likely going to get this. This is what happens when you have diabetes and somebody's very matter of fact, especially if you're at a young age, that kind of becomes part of your belief system. So it's very good that, you know, it's, it's that you didn't hear that and you didn't have that. Cause even though I heard that, um, I lived it, you know, I believed that probably until I was almost 20 years old. So it did affect me very much. So it's a good thing that you weren't told that. Cause I think people are still kind of in that way. Like you said, you see them on social media and people yeah. are still being told these things that are, Unfortunately, not really true, but unfortunately, shape the way people behave because they believe exactly. them to be true. Well, it, it just causes so much fear, and and you can't live a happy life if you're constantly terrified that you're going to get sick and you're going to die early. And, you know, horrible complications are going to happen to you. So, whenever I you know see anybody who's got a, a young child or, or actually any adult that's diagnosed. I, I love to tell them not to be afraid, you know, not to be afraid, to embrace it, not to treat it like something to be terrified of. And yeah. to, to actually make diabetes your friend um, and love it and care for it. You know, I'm, I'm not angry about being diabetic. And I think that comes from those early years of, of having a pretty healthy attitude around me. And, and people didn't fuss over me as I grew up as a, as a teenager. You know, I don't, I don't remember talking to many people about it at all. Um, I never met any other diabetics till for about 40 years. I never spoke to other diabetics. So it was in some ways pretty lonely, but it made me keep it in its place. It wasn't an issue. It was just something that, you know, I had to do, take time to do this and take time to do that. But it didn't 
you know, it didn't stop me, it didn't hold me back, and, and I wasn't afraid of it. And, and I just feel so, so grateful for that now when I, when I see other people struggling. I almost kind of see it like my mission now is to try and reassure people about it and, you know, make them not afraid and make them, you know, take risks and go diving and go skydiving and, you know, go walking up mountains because, you know, you can do it. Right. Um, and I agree. And that's why I, you know, I first even heard that you existed, you know, love through our wonderful diabetes online community. We get connected. The more you kind of put yourself out there, the more people you're going to connect with. That's just kind of the law of statistics. You're going to more interaction you have, the more people you're going to meet. And I was lucky enough to meet you. And when I heard your story, I kind of said 50 years with diabetes, obviously she's doing something right. I need to get you know, find out what she's doing and, you know, at least just share the story. And it's very, I love hearing people share their stories because we all have our own story, but hearing little pieces of other people's stories allows us to kind of have the strength to possibly begin telling a different story or something of that nature. Like I have done, you know, in my life, just seeing other people who lived a very long, healthy life and were still kind of happy and healthy. That was one of the biggest things for me when I was around 20 years old, 18 to 20, that changed my mind about the fact that I thought that I was going to die at 40 or 50 years old. Like that was what I, I believed that because that's what I was told. And, but seeing other people who had made that not true, that is what helped me start a new story for myself. Part of it, a big part of it. So I know what you're doing out there is definitely helping people because I was out there needing that help. That was, you know, 13, 14 years ago, you know, so I'm sure with the rise of incidents of diabetes everywhere, we need it. We need that kind of light to kind of guide us. So <laughs> you're yeah. doing a good thing. Uh, there's something I'd, I'd love to share that, that um, my, my current specialist said to me, and um, which I absolutely love, you know, I, I can't remember why it came up, but he said to me when, when he gets to see somebody who's newly diagnosed, he's, he's, he says to them, I'm afraid there's two things you'll never be able to do. And, you know, their faces presumably drop. Um, and he, he said, I'm afraid you won't be able to be an astronaut or be a fighter pilot. But other than that, you'll be fine. And I just think that just puts it in its place and shows you, you know, I think that's such a lovely way of, of expressing it. Because, it, you know, it's, it's almost like a, a joke, isn't it? Imagine if you're 10 years old and the doctor says to that, that to you, it's just going to set you free, really, and stop you thinking that it's going to prevent you doing anything. Yeah. So I love that story. It's very good. It's a good one. And so as we normally do, one of the things that I kind of like to delve into, and you kind of alluded to it earlier, is that no matter you know how good things are, we people with diabetes regardless of how well kind of adjusted we are, even how I feel now, how I am well adjusted. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, but the thing is, is that we all have our struggles. And, you know, I think we share a common one. You mentioned having a kind of a rocky relationship with food. So maybe, maybe that wasn't even diabetes related. How did that start for you? Or was it diabetes related? Yeah, well, I, I think diabetes played a part in it for sure. Because, you know, when I went from home from hospital, when I was a teenager, weighing and measuring food, becoming a little bit obsessed about it, starting to put weight on, um, getting very anxious about my weight and, and shape and all the rest of it. As a teenager, I started to diet and then put it back on again and then diet and put it back on again. And I, I'm pretty sure that I used food to manage my emotions and whether that was connected with diabetes or not, I think the choice of food as my, my crutch, if you like, was certainly related to it. Because, you know, let's face it, you have to force feed yourself quite often. Absolutely. If your blood sugars are low. In those days, obviously, there was no blood testing. So you didn't know you were low until you felt strange and there was no way of checking. Um, and, you know, you didn't want to walk eat something if you were out with your mates um, but you had to and and I think that skews your relationship with food quite a lot Absolutely. Um, I, I agree with that very much the more information you have about something that you know can already be a little bit stressful like when you have to like we do with the measuring and the not just measuring of the food but measuring of the insulin and then worrying about mitigating the low that might happen it's uh 
yeah, it can, I think it skews every person with diabetes relationship with food. Yeah. Even, well, I, I've, I've had quite a long discussion with a, a, a very well-known psychiatrist in London who is a specialist on diabetes and eating disorders. And she says that it's estimated, estimated that 40% of people with type one have food issues. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's an eating disorder, but have you know serious problems with food. And that is a massive percentage. And it's, it's I mean, it's a terrible thing to, to say, but it kind of reassures me that I'm not totally crazy, that actually it's very common. And, and we ought to talk about it more. And healthcare professionals ought to be trained better to recognize it. Because throughout my life, or for the first 40 years of my type one, I, I gained weight, lost weight. I was never, you know, particularly obese. I was overweight and I was never very thin. So people looked at me and thought, well, you know, what's wrong with you? You're fine. And I raised many times over the years my anxiety about my, my shape and weight. And, you know, you could, they, the doctors could see my weight going up and down like this. Um, but it was never really considered a problem. And I think now, thank goodness, doctors would realize that that was a problem and that, you know, if you're dieting manically, that is going to be quite serious, you know, for your, your diabetes, you are going to get more hypos. And if you're overeating, that's dangerous too. And it's, um, I just think it's so important that more general practitioners and specialists recognize that and, and try to help people. And, you know, after 40 odd years of asking and joining every diet club in the country and, um, you know, trying every, everything I ever could, I've, I've done everything to try and handle the food. And eventually I got specialist help. Eventually it took such a long time. That I was going to ask you. So I remember you said earlier that you kind of just recently made your peace with your relationship with food and that's through the specialist yeah. help. Is that what happened? Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I, I can't remember how long it, ago it was, but it, you know, it's several years. Um, and I now feel absolutely, totally at ease and at peace with food. Um, and I eat anything. I don't diet. Um, I think dieting is dangerous because you deny yourself and you want it even more. Absolutely. So, Psychological, yes. And, 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 and in this, the specialist therapy I had, there was some very interesting tricks they had to help you not be afraid of food because if you're dieting too much you start to fear um i mean an example this is quite a lot of detail but it's quite interesting for me yeah, i'm is, sure everybody is, wants to hear it yeah well you know for many many years i never ate nuts high calorie nuts who wants to eat those i just you know i was always trying to lose weight now i'm you know my weight is normal and it's not fluctuating I adore nuts and you know I eat nuts every single day and I don't deny myself and I'm not afraid of them anymore yes. so I, I feel totally free I feel totally free to eat anything at any time and I don't I don't ever overeat now and and it's just like it's just like such a freedom mm -hmm. you know I, I, I'm just so relieved to have finally got there and so grateful for the help that I had you know, in the later half of my life, the later part, um, to actually reach that point. Yeah, and I think a good point to take from that is that, you know, you were suffering with that kind of on again, off again relationship with food for many years. And I know a lot of people out there that probably watching this may be going through the same thing. I think it's a great example to say, it's like, look, it's never too late to look for help. You know, I've been in therapy many times throughout my life for various different reasons at various different times. But I can say that having the ability to talk to somebody who's unbiased and in your case is a specialist who has um, worked with other people who are kind of struggling in the same realm can be invaluable. You know, I'm sure that you're grateful all the time that you found this person that you were able to work with them. So the point is here, ask for help. We all need help. We all need to, you know, whatever it is that our issues are, we're not most likely when they're deeply ingrained like that and something psychological and emotional that, you know, comes along with having a chronic illness, we need help and that's okay. And it's, we have to just be kind of come to peace with being 
able to reach out for it when we need it. And I think that's yeah. a great example. Also. Yeah. So I was going to say before we kind of move forward, I know I wanted to uh, have a chance for you to show your medal because we have medals in America, but they're, I'm assuming they're much different than the medals from the UK. So I don't know um, how often we get to see a 50 year, what is it from the, from U JDRF UK or where does it? Uh, it comes from Diabetes UK, which is our, our national charity that cares and connects with mm -hmm. people who've got yeah. diabetes. I follow them on Twitter. <laughs> um, they, 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 they have a massive program of all sorts of things, you know, a care line, information line. They do education. Um, they do research as well. Um, and they gave me this medal, which I hope you can see. Um, yeah, so I was going to say, yeah, just hold it a little closer to the camera. Up a little bit. Bring it up towards your face. Towards your face. There we go. Very nice. All right. So you have I have I have seen the the Jocelyn and I know the Jocelyn one's bigger. I have applied for the Jocelyn one and I'm waiting to hear from them. So I'm sure you're going to get it. <laughs> I hope so. It seemed like an odd process to go through it and they, you know, have to fill out a form and mm -hmm. I had to dig out an old letter that my GP had to take hours searching through through my old paper files and, and you could barely read it. It was all creased and crumpled like an ancient parchment. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've sent that over to them and you know, I, I'm, I'm very, very proud of getting that medal. I, there's something else I'd like to say, which I think is quite different in the UK. Until I joined social media, you know, two to three years ago, I had never heard of a diversity. Nobody here had ever mentioned it. I'd never heard of it and I started going online and you know chatting to people all over the world and, I, and you know I thought god these people are making such a big thing when they get to their you know their anniversaries um, and it, it was new to me and I hadn't hadn't really been thinking how many years I'd been diagnosed I didn't really know you know it, it wasn't until fairly recently that I realized it just came upon me it was here and now it now it is here, and I've got that medal. I just feel so so grateful, actually, for having you know made it and 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 having lived well. And and I I do feel kind of proud of myself too because you know it's not easy. There there have been some very tough times, even though it, you know I never made a big deal of it. There have been some terrible times, and and, and I'd also like to mention shout out for my husband because <laughs> and partners and parents everywhere because they have to go through worse than we do sometimes because if we conk out they're the ones who have to pick up the pieces and you know it's fine for us because we're out of it and we don't even know it's happening but my husband's very squeamish and hates syringes and you know he's given me glucagon several times and managed me through a seizure you know where my blood sugar's been desperately low and I'd just like to say a big thank you to all the partners and parents and um, friends who, yeah. who, who help to support us when, when we're in need. I think that is a very, valid, a very valid shout out. I am huge in debt to, I mean, like just like you, my husband and my mom growing up, just taking care, like you said, giving us glucagon and just, you know, they have a role that sometimes seems like it might be even a little bit more stressful because they... Yeah all they want to do is help and do something yeah but they actually can't really do anything except you know support us and which is invaluable again priceless but they want to be able to fix something like and we're the only ones that can really make those choices so they're kind of just like yeah. sitting right there on the outside looking in and loving us and wanting the best for us but can't really can't really jump in and do anything immediately so i totally agree and i can attest to the fact that your husband is a lovely person because I got to have brunch with you both in London. And also I wanted to add something funny that her husband actually taught me and you together in, the, in London, in the UK, anything that you order that's dessert is pudding. Is this is correct, right? <laughs> so it could be cake or cookies or anything, but it's pudding because they use the word pudding to describe dessert. <laughs> so her husband was having pudding with brunch and I thought he was going to have pudding, but it was not. It was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, the different language is funny. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I just wanted to follow up on about the medal, two, a couple things. One, you should be hugely proud. And I was just saying before we started that I'm looking forward to getting my 25 year medal in 2016 because it is significant. It is something that we should celebrate. We should give ourselves all the credit in the world. And I think just in general, in a psychological term, whether you have diabetes or you don't, if you don't celebrate all the efforts that you put into life and that you made it, you're alive, you're, you know, you're doing well, even if you're not doing well, you're here and you have, you know, the fact that you have had this disease for so long, that's, you have to celebrate that kind of stuff. And to feel like it's insignificant, I feel like makes us feel like we are insignificant by not being open to embracing the accomplishments that we've, you know, kind of accomplished. And I think we have this tendency as human beings to like, you know, we're like, oh, well, that's great. If somebody else does it, it's a big deal. But if I do it, it's like, well, oh, whatever, no big deal. It's like, we have to stop playing down our awesomeness. <laughs> that's yeah. really the best way I can put it. Like, we have to celebrate everything that we've done and just say, look, we're pretty amazing people here dealing with this disease in 50 years. It's like, you know, hopefully, you know, I, I look forward to my 50 year. That's what I'll say. <laughs> well, I look forward to my 75, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Why not? Why not? There's, you know, nothing stops me. I'm, I'm very, um, I suppose, one, the characteristics that diabetes give you, for me, are hugely um, special because they've made me resilient. It's made me resilient and it's made me determined. And I don't think I would have those characteristics otherwise. You know, I was a very quiet person um, when I was younger, very retiring you know, got embarrassed easily, all the rest of it. But now I, I, I feel as strong as an ox. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll talk to anyone, I'll stand up for anything, and I feel very free and, and able to do that. And I do, I'm grateful to diabetes for having built my character, I suppose is what I'm saying, Absolutely. having made me a strong person. Um, so, you know, people, anybody, out there who's sort of hating their diabetes remember it does actually confer helpful characteristics on your character after a while it does actually change the person who you are and makes you into something better yeah I agree I couldn't agree with you more I always say all the time that if it wasn't for diabetes um, you know the majority of my family um, other than my actual mother has is or has been obese I have about I think I have about maybe three living family members left in my entire family. I mean, I have one of the smallest families because they were very unhealthy people. It ate very unhealthy foods and had heart disease and all variety of cancers and also type two diabetes. And, and I, I know that if, if I didn't have diabetes, I would have most likely gone down that same path because that's just human nature to kind of follow the example that has been set for us. So, mm. yeah, I totally agree. It makes you it makes you what you allow it to make you. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, since I, since I stopped work a couple of years ago, I have devoted my life really to um, trying to share and what 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 I've learned and and help other people. Um, you know, and I I. I I have a lot of free time, but actually my diary is totally full because I'm, I'm all the time volunteering and doing things. And, and it's very easy because I know it all. It's all in my head. I don't have to read up lots of things. Um, so I just share it and, and try and give feedback to people who are working with people who've got diabetes and try and help them improve the services. And, and I get huge reward from doing that. It's, it's you know, it's very affirming to know that you've actually got something which might help other people so I'm not not doing it um, unselfishly I'm getting a lot out of doing it but I hope that at the same time I'm giving as well as I'm getting um, and it's it's great fun I love it I love talking to people about it so you know I do spend an awful lot of time on it these days we need as many patient we need as many well-informed patient advocates as we can get in the diabetes world. So what you're doing out there is, uh, I mean, there's a huge need for it. And obviously the way you talk about it, 
you're passionate about it. This makes you happy. If you make you feel fulfilled. So obviously that's what you're, you're meant to be doing it. And I'm very glad you're doing it there. And, um, I just, I'm sure people are going to follow suit, you know, seeing what you're doing and helping doctors make patients or helping doctors help patients have a better experience. So, and that's huge. It's also huge over here right now. And I guess always has been so, uh, but it's really just coming to the surface that patients need a stronger voice. So it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they need to find their own voice as well. And I, I appreciate that that can take many years until you feel strong and free enough to do it. Well, yeah, but, yeah. we see people, that's the thing though, by you doing that, for yourself and then going ahead and doing that for others that allows other people to then do that for themselves because yeah. we get to say things like well if she's doing it I can do it and that leading by example is the best way that we can influence people to do anything and that only makes me happy when people are doing it to influence people to do things that are good for them their health and their wellness and their happiness so I mean yeah yeah we need more people like you <laughs> Well, yeah, there's, there's one other thing I'd just like to share because it's, it's very recent. Just yesterday, um, I have three other friends with type 1 who live very locally to me. And we met actually on a sports weekend, a diabetics sports weekend, sports weekend, which was huge fun. And since then, we've become very close friends. And we decided to set up, um, well, we call it a meetup for type 1s. And we invited, you know, whoever we could on Facebook and all the rest of it. And we had a meeting last night and there were 15 turned up. Wow. In Harrow, where I live. And I, today I just feel like so happy that we are obviously helping meet a need. Because the room, we were in a, a, a hotel bar, having a drink, chatting. The room was literally vibrating with the the energy of people talking to each other it was it was just electric to see it and and some quite young people who'd never met other people with type 1 before and i you know today i've been like walking on the clouds because i just feel so pleased that we we've, we've done this and we've started it and i i think it'll grow um i think so too and i think that's just the first time I was ever at a diabetes conference, I had that same experience because although I had met other people with diabetes before, I'd never gotten to spend uh, an elongated period of time with them just kind of chatting about whatever we felt like talking about and you know how diabetes relates to everything in our lives. And it's like, I think what you're doing where you are is you're fulfilling a very real need, which is human connection. That's what humanity is meant to do is connect together with each other so we can help each other get further than we were when we were not together. And I think when you're bringing that dynamic into it, you only good things can come and only it can only grow because everybody's going to continue loving it. And they're just going to continue telling other people when it is applicable that it exists. So you might have a real movement on your hands there um, for diabetes kind of chat groups whatever you have to come up with a name for it. <laughs> yeah. it's gonna be big yeah yeah well it's it the, the the thing i notice is everything i go to and i go to quite a lot of things everybody is laughing all the time we we just kind of instantly get to each other's sense of humor you know some quirky little thing like you might have done something silly with some with your pump or some oh, funny or, or there's a test strip hanging off of your shirt because that's exactly exactly <laughs> and we just last night we just sat and, and laughed most of the night and it, it's just a lot of fun as well as being motivating because you know when you're talking to other people and asking questions and learning it's very it makes you very motivated to 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 look after yourself you know better um, but at the same time, it's just huge fun. Yeah. And even though we come from hugely different walks of life, we have an instant connection. Yeah. And you can literally see it. You can literally see people as soon as they meet and start to chat. It's, it, it, it's wonderful. I just feel so excited about it still. Good. Um, and I can't wait to hear how this unfolds or continues to unfold because I think that you have, I have a big handful coming your way that you're going to probably end up needing help you know, from the community, you're probably going to build like this giant UK type one community. So I'll be on the lookout well, for that. <laughs> I, I doubt that we're just doing it locally, but 
you know, it's it's great. That's how really happy about that. that. <laughs> it's very rewarding. Well, I mean, I I'll, I'm gonna you're gonna keep me posted on that, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But um, so I always want to keep talking because obviously we could sit here and chat about diabetes all day. Um, we're obviously very passionate about it, but as a good person who conducts the interviews, I have to keep us on track. So I'm going to move us to, since you've already given us so many good tips, you maybe you're going to just reiterate some, but what are your top three tips for thriving with diabetes that you've learned over the last 50 years? Okay. Well, when, when I meet people um, who are fairly newly diagnosed, my, my first tip is always to join the online community. But I think anybody watching this is a convert. So that's an aside, but it's it's really number one. But the, the, the other things that I think are sort of maybe quite quite tough things to to learn are the fact that I don't think you can blame diabetes for all life's problems. And I had a, a doctor about 20 or 30 years ago, Professor Robert Elkeles at St. Mary's Hospital in London. And he said to me, he, he's quite a quiet man, he said to me, do you know, you can't blame your diabetes for all of life's problems. And at the time, I found that tough. I mm. found it really tough. But over the years, and it has taken years, mm. I have realized the wisdom of that and that you can deal with problems without involving your diabetes um, and you can't blame it for everything, you know. And, and I just think that's a really useful thing to remember when things are going bad separate your diabetes out look after it but deal with the problem and don't blame the diabetes don't make it the devil on your back um, because you can't live happily with a devil on your back <laughs> love it look after it and deal with the problem yep i think so that's excellent advice that that's that that that's a, you know it's quite special to me and quite personal as well um, I think the other one I, I've said is to make diabetes your friend and, and, and not make it an enemy. I, I actually visualize it not as something out there, um, but something inside me that I love and care for. It's part of me. It is me. So it's not it over there. It's it within me. And I love it and I care for it. And it's like a baby and it needs nurturing and it needs a lot of attention and it needs feeding and it needs, you know, it's nappies changing. You, you've got to look after it and treat it like a, a vulnerable infant. I think, that's, I think that that just leads back to my kind of baseline of everything is that love is always the way. Because to me, if you love something or you put love into it or you approach a situation with love, you're going <clears> to <throat> have a much easier time dealing with whatever that is, even if it is painful at times or stressful at times. If you come from a place of love, if you say, look, I love myself, I deserve to have, I deserve to be treated well, and diabetes is part of me, and you, like you said, you internalize it like that, I think that's very powerful. I think mm. that we all need to kind of explore a little bit more. Yeah. And my, my final tip would be something I feel passionate about, and that's to volunteer for research. Um, one of the things that has really motivated me hugely in the last five years or so was, you know, volunteering to take part in a research project. And, and, and since I started it, I've realized that A, you learn massive amounts, B, you meet really enthusiastic researchers and doctors and other people with diabetes. And it is just so interesting and exciting and it, it, it's fun as well it's fun I mean I've done many things that are not it's not like clinical trials where you're taking this or trying that there's many forums you know they just want people to sit around a table and look at a new bit of kit or um, they want ideas about how to you know develop some new sensor and it's actually huge fun so I would really really urge people to, to volunteer and you know take the time to do it because you'll learn you'll be motivated and actually you'll have fun yeah i think that's and all you're giving something back as well very you know. sound, yeah very sound advice just like when you said earlier about volunteering you know you're you think when you first volunteer because i've been volunteering 
for probably since I was a young teenager that you think you're doing it for some type of, you know, I'm going to give back and I'm going to do that. And that's your intention. But like you said, it ends up being so fulfilling for yourself that like you said, you almost hope that you're being able, you're able to give back as much as you're actually getting from the experience. Exactly. So, yeah, but it's a win-win you're yep. giving and you're, you're getting. So it's, it's the perfect thing to do for a happy, balanced life, you know? Very <laughs> cool. So uh, I always want to ask if you have anything else that you'd like to share with anybody watching before we wrap things up. Um, well, just thank you for having me. Um, just that, really. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, no, it's very much my pleasure. I have a very strong um, desire to connect with people with diabetes all over the world, just much like you. And I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to meet you in person and also now bring you and your story to the diabetes online community for people just to spread awareness, you know? And um, so I'm not sure, you know, I'll have a way maybe that people can contact you. Well, I'm not sure yet. We haven't discussed that, but <clears throat> I'll, if Liz wants you to be able to kind of send her an email, I'll of course always put the link below. Cause that's what I always do for people is put their links below. And if there's any, uh I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Perfect. Then I will put those links below and people can yeah. connect with you on Twitter and Facebook and, you know, kind of, I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of people that want more of your wisdom once they kind of see what you have to offer. So we'll give you those below the video as we always do. Um, but for that, that's pretty much it for now. And uh, so Liz, thank you for uh, joining us from the future, as I always say, because she's uh, five hours ahead of time now than we are here. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, thank you for your time. <laughs> all right cool so that's good we're going to wrap it up for this episode and we will catch you next time take care thank you liz okay bye-bye